I actually started my career on, on what I'll say the technology side, and, and the theme that you're going to see in the presentation is, is that I see uh, technology different than infrastructure. Um, so I started as a teenager coding software uh, for the Apple II. They were text-based adventure games like Zork and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and fun, fun stuff like that. Um, hobbyist as a kid, I ran a bulletin board service before really the internet got around and I got completely lucky because the internet showed up at the same time I had people dialing into my computer so it became a natural progression and grew to a pretty good size ISP in the earlier days. Uh, then went to uh, get into the infrastructure side. Uh, so I had started two companies. Uh, the second company, which was a voice over IP company as I was moving beyond that. I went to work for a company called AboveNet, which at the time was the second biggest data center company in the world. And aside from being a customer of the data center, I, I knew nothing about uh, facilities, electrical, mechanical, infrastructure related stuff that was foreign to me, so I had to learn a lot. And then from AboveNet, I went to uh, Yahoo and eventually became their VP of uh, data center operations and engineering. So I went there to really define their, and execute their data center strategy. And then uh, lastly, before my new company, I was uh, the VP of Global Infrastructure for Apple. So uh, same kind of thing, defining their strategy and where the best place is to go, getting these things built, trying to do things using some technology and such. Um, and I'm gonna explain uh, a, a little bit that the next question is, is what are you doing? And when you look in your guide, uh, I, I started a small little company. We're still about nine people sitting around a, a table in a small room. Uh, still, still in stealth mode, but I think in my presentation you're going to see some areas that I'm kind of interested in that I'm, that I'm focused on. And then uh, lastly, why, why would I leave the greatest data center uh, job in the world with Apple? Um, I've been an Apple guy since I was a kid. I first met Steve Jobs when I was 10 years old. Uh, still an Apple guy. We actually had to uh, redo the presentation in PowerPoint because I, I don't do PowerPoint. Uh, so we just did that a couple of minutes ago. Uh, so let me explain kind of... Uh, try to get a premise on, on why I went from Apple to the small little company. It really likes the slide. Hello. Want to go into manual mode here? I promise I know how to use. I don't know if that was you or me, but we're going to go with it. A um, couple reasons. One, I'm a reflection kind of guy. Number two, I'm an inspiration guy. I always say most of the quote unquote innovations that I've worked on are just simple copies of things that other people have done in the past. Uh, I, I did a lot of studies over the past couple years on what the future of the internet, and in particular what the future of data center infrastructure looks like. And when I combined all these things together, I saw a really big problem, uh, and that's when you're supposed to start companies. Uh, I, my, it was really almost uh, 15 years between my last company and this one. I was just waiting for a good problem. Uh, so, so I think I've got one. First of all, let's get into inspiration so you guys kind of know in that topic what I'm talking about. Boom, here's a Apple infrastructure project, uh, hopefully 2015. Uh, this is public, this is the corporate campus. I think it's gonna be pretty neat. Relative to inspiration, uh, Sir Norman Foster, the, arguably the top architecture firm in the world, surely is uh, influenced. This is actually, if you go to LAX, this is the, uh, the terminal tower uh, opened in 1961. Again, that space theme in the mid-century was pretty common. We copied that a lot. That would be. The Yahoo chicken coop design. Uh, a lot of people looked at this kind of stuff when I worked on it, and, and again, you get into inventions and patents and all this fun stuff. This was an experiment of how do we effectively use outside air, uh, pretending like we don't have refrigerant-based cooling systems. And exactly how you do that, in, in my simple mind, is you go back to 1910, and you looked at steel and aluminum smelting facilities where they had to move a massive amount of heat through a building, and there was no such thing as air conditioning systems. How did they do it? Well, you take air into the side, allow heat to rise like it naturally does, evacuate out of the building. Uh, there's some of the unique shape uh, building influence. Uh, some of the new data center design, which really allows 
administra central administrative function in the building with different blocks of data center. A block could be built first, B block, C block, D block, kind of scalable growth centered around a central administrative function. There's the data center fully built out. That's the uh, Eastern State uh, Penitentiary, uh, <laughs> built in, in 1829. And I'd like to add that there's still prisons today that are using this influence and in design. Over 500 prison designs have been influenced around this particular design of, uh, in essence, scalable wings um, serviced by a central administrative function. So again, kind of fun stuff. Current inspiration, uh, some of the fun stuff I'm working at Apple that actually made me leave Apple. Uh, I got to spend some time looking at modern manufacturing. Um, and what was interesting is, is I can't talk too much about the Apple stuff, but I went to South Carolina in the States to the BMW's uh, Modern Flexible Factory and I spent some days there. And uh, I reached out because I read an article in Business Information Magazine or something about all these things they were doing in manufacturing. So I, uh, I, I did as a, as a stalker does. I looked up the guy in the article, found him on LinkedIn, and I reached out to him and said, hey, I, I do data centers, you do factories, can I come and hang out with you? And uh, he was excited, oh, you build this cyberspace, I want to learn what you're doing. And I have to admit, when I was flying back from South Carolina, I was sitting on the plane, and uh, what I experienced hit me like a ton of bricks. It made me realize how far behind we are in the data center space. Um, it, it reminded me how all of my learnings over the past years in infrastructure kind of skewed me further away from my technology roots than what I would have preferred. And it, it changed my way of thinking uh, just by a simple reminder and spending time here. I'm going to get back to this. Reflection. So first of all, let's look at this. This has been uh, a large part of my career, the emergence of uh, the internet. Uh, and again, this is US driven growth because quite frankly, the emergence of the internet was kind of driven out of the US. This is a big part of my career. 1995 to 2012, I call it the emergence from paper analog society to digital society. What does that look like? It's, it's crazy. Um, in the US alone, 11,000 megawatts of growth. Uh, this isn't just internet, this is all data center related growth um, within this time frame. Uh, it's weird because I think through my career, maybe of that 120 billion, I think maybe I get close to 10 billion of that spending. Uh, so it's been fun uh, doing fun stuff and spending money. Other things that are interesting is, is, uh, is um, watts per citizen. Uh, what, what does the, the back-end computing machine look like on a per-citizen perspective? You see the U.S. grew from about 3 watts per citizen of back-end computing power constantly running to about 37. Uh, the emergence of the internet from about under 20 million to 225 million users. Uh, a lot of us all had this part in this emerging market growth. Um, back on my first question slide, if I have my notes, it was going to remind how many how many people have been in this business under five years or under in the data center business? Awesome. It's good to see a couple. One of the things I wanted to point out is, is in a startup space, uh, and it, I'm calling myself to the mat on a lot of these things, if, if this was an a, uh, iPhone app developing uh, conference, it would be almost everyone raising their hands. I found that in the startup space. it's. Uh, Tough to find new thinkers coming out of school thinking about data centers. They're not being taught any of that. So it, it kind of is reflecting you know, the, the state of our industry. 40% of the world's data centers, according to our studies, and I had a pretty good team working on this. We work with a lot of energy players. We work with a lot of uh, scholarly people. And we, learn, we work with some of our competitors are US based. Uh, so, quite frankly, it's been a, a U.S.-based world when it comes to data center infrastructure, and, and a lot of people have uh, tried to replicate that model, which we're going to try to get it, we're going to get into. Again, I talked about this. This is uh, Asia growth in regards to watts per citizen uh, compared to U.S. growth. Currently in Asia, it's about three watts per citizen versus the 37. Just to put that in perspective, so uh, we're about a Old, old school light bulb, constantly powered, where in Asia, uh, there perhaps is a lot of growth to occur, perhaps not to this level. 
Uh, boy, in the past decade, so I, I talk about the 11,000 megawatts of growth. Um, the past decade, about 20, almost a quarter of that growth is in the wholesale data center market in the US. This is just between four providers. Uh, Corsite, uh, DuPont Fabros, uh, Digital Realty Trust, and Cyrus One. That, that growth is comprised of that 11,000 megawatts over at least the past 10 years, about 25% of that growth. So again, you see the transition between co-location uh, to wholesale, you know, once you get to the several megawatt level where wholesale makes sense, and then once you get, you know, perhaps to the five megawatt level, people start getting into owned and operated. <coughs> again, look at some trends of the growth. So again, questioning. Uh, I, I question myself in my career a lot. And uh, the first thing is, is, is I'm gonna, in the end of the presentation, I'm gonna show you some slides. And the basic premise is, is in the US, 40% of the world's data centers, under 10% of the world's traffic, end user traffic. I've got a problem with that, and I'm gonna show you a couple reasons why that is not sustainable, and why the shift of data center growth is really gonna go from a US-focused growth to what I'll call an emerging market uh, area growth. So the first question, because I've been part of this uh, adventure, is, is the way we do data centers today effectively replicatable in these emerging markets? Uh, and, we, and we get into the process. Uh, I'm a smart ass. This is the NSA data center project, which has just been a cluster of problems. Uh, <laughs> kind of makes me happy a little bit. Uh, needless to say, um, site selection. The right people who know precisely what to look for and go to governments and negotiate for precisely the right things, I honestly trust about 25 people in the world who are really good at that, who really have the experience at large scale for at least these massive scale data centers. All of them are in the US. From a design perspective, arguably the vast majority of innovations uh, albeit I'll challenge how innovative we've been, has been US driven. Once you have a design, let's go to a difficult part of the world, China. Where are the mission critical specialist uh, general and subcontractors that can build this complex design? They don't exist, that, that's what I rely on in the US, a small community of these mission critical specialists. Once your site's uh, underway, uh, where are the, the uh, superintendents, the MEP coordinators that know how to techni technically get these complex projects together. Construction management. How is this thing commissioned? Uh, in my new company, I've been documented visits to about 32 data centers in China, none of which have been commissioned. We don't do commissioning in China. Uh, frankly, when we did the first project very recently in the Yantian area, Shenzhen, we couldn't find load banks. We had to go to Alibaba and get these little space heaters and long story, something crafty. Uh, doesn't exist, they're not testing their sites. They don't have the expertise. Operations, do you have the expertise to run these things in Indonesia or wherever it may be? Question that. When you look at this entire process, perhaps the current method of delivering data centers is broken. BMW designed their factory so that they can build it anywhere in the world pretty simply. Um, and I'll explain some of the reasons how they did that. Perhaps in the data centers, we've set things so complex that the average efficiency, once you get out of mature markets, and, and by the way, Australia, I consider more of a mature market because there's a lot of fits with, with, um, with the US, 40% um, less efficient in precisely the places of the world that need to be more efficient. I'll use China as an example. Averages are significantly less efficient. They're building 1990 caliber data centers, um, at least in my eyes. And these are the places of the world that are the most polluted um, and have some of the biggest energy challenges. To me, that's a problem. <coughs> now let's look at ourselves. Um, I, I said I come from a technology background. And when I get on a plane and, and the guys from BMW are out innovating me, um, I, I question if I lost my technology edge playing in this infrastructure space. So in essence, do data centers enable or inhibit technology advancement? Perhaps the infrastructure and technology are oil and water, different things. 
When we think of real estate guys, construction guys, infrastructure facilities, do we think about nimble technology change? Um, as a technologist, and I'll use an example because I come from the Apple side of the house. Um, if you were uh, a, a group of folks that are developing that I, uh, iPhone app uh, for the Apple store, and, and we're in a convention, uh, you are expected to evolve your technology, um, quite frankly, in agile software environment, almost monthly. You're making updates and advancements almost monthly, and that's very common in that space. Yet here we are, we talk about things, uh, about 15 year decisions and things that last 15 years. Um, does anything that have to do with 15 years have anything to do with technology? I question that. We're on the server side, uh, I'll use a couple examples. Perhaps that's a different world. Are we enabling or inhib inhibiting that world? Let's look at a, a space that I am uh, got to spend a lot of time looking at. Let's look at this evolution here from the 1990s, that the Motorola brick phone stopped being made in 1994 to the 2010s today. I believe they said that if you built a, this is a recent article, if you built a Motorola brick phone with the technology capability of a processing storage battery uh, perspective, it would cost $3.5 million to produce that iPhone in 1993, um, 20 years ago. $3.5 million to build that technology into a device. We have about a thousand, taking that as a single metric, about a thousand X improvement. Battery technology is multi, uh, about 200% improved when you look at things. Um, an entirely different side of the world. And what's crazy, when you look at the new technologies, you go, holy crap, battery advancements are expected to get thousands times better. Look at what Tesla's doing with their Gigafactory on, on batteries and, and how they expect to produce technologies for multiple industries. Uh, pretty cool. Let's look at supercomputing and advancement again over the past 20 years. 800x improvement in performance over the past 20 years at significantly lower cost. That's technology. Here's infrastructure. Quite frankly, and I'm being a little bit of a smart ass because I'm frustrated by myself. When you build infrastructure and you need it to last for 15 to 30 years, this is an infrastructure way of thinking. It's not about technology. You need the road to be stable. You need it to be straight. Uh, avoiding pot hip, uh, potholes is, is, is uh, some of the technicalities. Let's look in the data center. 1950s, that's cool. I have some fun pictures on that. That's the National Climactic Data Center in 1956 in the United States. What existed back then? 19-inch cabinet, rack mounting standards, uh, raised floor. Um, look at the, the uh, rotary UPS system detached from a diesel engine um, existed. Going into 1960s, uh, now you have uh, attached to a generator. That's an awesome picture. That's uh, high tech, actually. Uh, going into 1970s, um, online, offline UPS, static UPS modules uh, using lead acid batteries. Uh, I believe that's 1972. Um, by and large, the same batteries that are uh, largely being used in, in many of our sites today. Is, is this a drastic technology improvement or Maybe not. And again, we have to question, when you develop something with a 15-year life cycle, does that life cycle itself, and that mentality itself, sync technology innovation? Why does the battery advance so far on here? Because when new devices are coming out every six months and people are willing to upgrade their device, which is a separate challenge, you must innovate on a six-month technology cycle. When you have $120 billion worth of data centers that are built, none of which are upgradable, how encourages an industry to, to make it advance that much further? There's our 19-inch rack standard. Uh, the 24-inch, which I think that is, is actually uh, defined in the same year. And you go, how did they define that when data centers didn't exist? They were called, uh, there was the railroad, railroad relay racks. 
Uh, that standard defined in 1934. And Neil Rao, who's a friend of mine, he's the founder of C Micro, uh, ne a next generation server company acquired by AMD, said, why do we always have to deal with this 19 inch cabinets? When, when we're learning more lessons from this, can, can that change? What, what if, what if I don't want to use your old 1970 batteries? Why can't you take them out? Because I have better batteries that I can use that last 24 hours for lower cost um, that wouldn't require a diesel generator. But then you're telling me you can't pull it out and it's built for 15 years? I can tell you between Apple and Yahoo, I went through seven generations of data centers in seven years. And I felt that I was, technology, I was an innovating technology. The only problem with that is, is all seven generations of those data centers are not upgradable to new technologies that enable uh, some things that I think are important. So we, we talked about data centers in a box and data centers and containers. Uh, this, is, this is a container, a uh, data center as a prison. And basically what you have here is you have your technology that goes into the prison. Uh, as, as far as I, I, I see a server as a, a prisoner who's serving a three-year term in a, in a prison <laughs> that doesn't change. Uh, fortunately, he gets out and, a, and, a, and an entirely new generation of server comes in. But when it comes to a mechanical perspective, how many of our mechanical plants are upgradable? Are we inhibiting technology by saying, this is what the density is? You know, we rolled a piece of dice and said, you know, this is what it's going to be for the next 15 years. This is our technology. We complain about uh, capacity plans. We have to rely on a 15-year capacity plan where in this business I've learned anything longer than even a one year is kind of junk because on the technology side you have to be nimble. On the infrastructure side you're looking at 15 years. Electrical infrastructure. If I want to use those 2,000x times battery technology in the data center servers, what do I do with the $120 billion worth of data centers that have existing UPS plants built into them like uh, in concrete? Software, Modbus physical infrastructures into building management systems, compare that to an agile software environment today. Customer racks we talked about. Again, the technology industry must deal with the fact that at the end of the day, their equipment is installed in an inflexible prison. That inhibits them. I believe a disaggregation, a new definition of disaggregating infrastructure from technology needs to occur. And I think in certain aspects of all of these boundaries, some things mechanical, electrical, software, and customer infrastructure needs to shift into the technology world. This isn't like a container, data center container that offers all solution. It's a shift. What are things that need to shift into here? Um, if five years from now, ultra capacitors are more efficient than lead acid batteries, how do, how do I upgrade my UPS? If the cloud becomes more nimble and I don't need UPS because I'm using geographic replication of function, how do I pull them out of there? If taxation on lead acid batteries because they're not good for the environment goes up, what are my solutions? If I want to use uh, Elon, Mu uh, Elon Musk's Gigafactory Ultra 2000X improved battery technology, how do I improve that? If I want to use liquid cooling in the data center versus 65 watts a square foot, take it or leave it. If I want software um, that, that changes more often than uh, maybe five years if you look at average, and maybe if I enable a new set of hardware that can allow different footprints to install in the data center, because perhaps they need to look differently. I think that's what needs to happen. So the answer to my question was a long answer. 15-year decisions have nothing to do with technology. That's an infrastructure decision. Disruptive, ah, disruptive disaggregation of technology and infrastructure must occur. And I believe that's going to reflect a major shift in our industry. Um, who defines where that line exists, uh, wins. Those that think it's just one side or the other, um, I, I think those are examples of why certain things, uh, when you jump into an extreme of like, we talked about containers today, maybe a little bit too far of a shift into one side. You, you don't put a factory in a container. Why would you put a data center in a container? Inspiration. Let's get back to this.
Let's compare legacy U.S. manufacturing to our current ways of doing data centers, which I'll say is a U.S. world as far as I'm concerned because we did a lot of stuff. It's called a champion syndrome. I told you I'm a retired fighter, um, so I, I've seen a lot of people go through this. I've never been a champion, so I honestly can't relate. But what the problem is, is when you become a champion, you are never going to do drastic change. You are going to do minimal adjustments to your game because any drastic change threatens your champion, your ability to remain champion. So in the US, modern manufacturing, the US was the dominant force that defined modern manufacturing coming out of World War II. Anyone wants proof? They won the war. That's what the US rested on. These are some examples. Times are good. Uh, see how happy this lady is? Way, you know, way happier than, than some of the other factories I've been. Let's look at the Germans and the Japanese. This is what they had to start with. The opposite side of the champion mentality is the defeated mentality, where you have to reinvent everything because you don't have anything. Revolution, reinvention, disruption, and reinvention must occur. And this is what we have. In modern manufacturing, real estate technology disaggregation has occurred. When any of these guys need to build a factory in China, the factory floor, which is nothing more than a big building with a medium voltage distribution ring, sewer water network ring, uh, that can be built by any quality builder around the world that has nothing to do with the tooling in the systems and the hardware and software platforms of that factory production line, are built around the world. They've learned that. I would say we haven't learned that. We still think that this is a built in stone uh, building asset. Lean methodology relative to capacity management. Uh, some good examples here is uh, relative to capacity is that when, number one, the, the couple of BMW metrics, technology advancement on the chassis plant. I actually saw a cool chart. And what the chart showed is, is the implementation of robotics in the chassis production line over a five year period. Previously, they had to build every single, uh, every single model's uh, chassis in a separate production line, uh, largely done by hand. And then during a five-year period, they transitioned where they have 700 robots and five humans operating the plant. And that same production line can produce every model chassis for BMW in a five-year period. Uh, in our data centers, we built the, the plants so they, they can evolve over the 15-year period because it's built static. Um, capacity planning. Uh, in a BMW, you can actually, within three days of when the car hits the production line, which is largely built that same day, you can make changes to the configuration um, and they can produce on the fly. Again, good examples of the modern flexible factory, which to put it quite simply is, the building is a completely separate thing the building is the infrastructure. The building is, still has electrical, mechanical, building management software is still in the building. Uh, still uh, is a big square box that's scalable, still run by facilities guys that wear blue collars. All the tooling that goes on these factory floors have nothing to do with those people. The hardware technology, the software technology, all evolves on a quarter by quarter basis. The software is all agile environment, involves faster than that. All the software that manages it, the process, procedure, protocol, is completely separated from the building. That's how factories are run today. And again, what you have here is that was completely invented by the Germans and the Japanese that were destroyed in the war because they had to figure out how to do things different and how to do things better, while the Americans felt that they had it figured out. Some of these things look familiar. In Detroit, by the way, I'm passionate about this. My dad was an auto worker before he was laid off in 1980, and I moved to California with my family. So I'm, uh, he's quite familiar with these. I learned from him. In Detroit, when you uh, build a factory production line, you, you build it in concrete like it's a building. What you would do back then is when that factory production line is outdated or the car model changes, you have to build another factory across town 
and then shut this factory down and spend six months blowing the building apart, at least from an interior perspective, and reconstructing it. It's kind of how you have to do data centers. The technology in these buildings, because they're built in stone as part of a real estate asset, are expected, and they financially depreciated them over 15 years. Again, I smart ass calling it technology. Um, that, that's the equivalent of, of some of the technology, quote unquote, infrastructure that we use in our building. Because they're building a 15 year depreciable asset, uh, they complain that they can't get a reliable 15 year capacity plan. In our business, I, I've never seen anything over a year that's reliable. Not upgradable or reconfigurable by any means without, without calling a construction uh, real estate reconstruction. And in essence, historically what you happen is in defining themselves in their new emerging markets, the Japanese through lean manufacturing, the Germans through flexible manufacturing, in essence, redefine the world of manufacturing. While the, Arab, while the Americans, we sat there and said, we have the dominating force, uh, we won the war, um, and quite largely remained exactly the same at minimum into the 1980s, still trying to catch up. All based on an arrogance that we were the big guys out of the gate, we defined how things were done, uh, we, we don't need to change, we're the champions. Uh, that's how I see us in the data center space. So why is growth going to shift to the emerging markets? One, population. First of all, three billion new users coming online. Uh, 25 million of which are US based. So of the growth, about less than 1% is US based. Combine that with performance. I was just complaining to the AV guys, they wanted to get on uh, iCloud. And I said, oh, iCloud kind of sucks here, it's too <laughs> slow. I could totally get like assassinated by Apple people. <laughs> um, but needless to say, uh, when you look at performance, a metric that's changed, at least by the by the big six internet players is, is for highly interactive engagements with end users, back end to end user, uh, highly personalized engagements. Um, we're looking at about 50 milliseconds or under, in essence from core data center to uh, at least closest pop relative to the end user. 50 milliseconds is the need, is the need for the kind of highly interactive app applications of today and the future. Currently, it's 58 in North America, US. Uh, we're largely meeting those needs. Asia is 2x worse. Pretty much most of the places in the world are almost 2x worse. Europe, because a large part of Europe is actually served from the US because culturally it's very similar. Um, Substandard performance, nowhere close to that 50 milliseconds. Yet, when I go to Hong Kong, if I'm a uh, dealing with an application that's served out of the Jean Quano data center park in Hong Kong. I've got great, obviously, sub 50 millisecond performance. So why is it 113? Well, when you balance that out with the traffic that's still served and the data that's still stored in the US that has to go across the Pacific, that's 230 milliseconds. This is not sustainable for the applications of tomorrow. So therefore, the 40% of the global world's capacity that's in the US it, it's completely imbalanced. I expect that to change. And then lastly, privacy. Speaking of Hong Kong, I was in a Japanese restaurant in a hotel when Edward Snowden was in Hong Kong <laughs> meeting with the Hong Kong government. And uh, their president is called the CEO and their head of information technology is called their CIO. And he looked across the table. The Hong Kongers um, are much, uh, le much more forward thinking, much less political than the American politicians I run into. He said, well, wait a second, if, if another country has access to the location data uh, and everything that's on the internet, so banking, perhaps banking data, healthcare data, uh, communications data, and then holy crap, maybe like microphone and maybe camera, um, isn't that a national security risk? And since that time in that question, you have countries like Brazil that are introducing legislation uh, to react accordingly. And I said, yeah. I said, going back to World War II, I would believe that if the Nazis had access to all of that data on all the American soldiers, I think they would have won the war. I think countries are going to begin to recognize that certain sectors of their data 
it's a national security interest to store them locally and be protected. And again, I expect that's going to shift kind of the market and where this growth is going to occur. What this looks like, um, if you look at all the funny math, uh, it presents this big picture of 3 billion users, the way we do things today, and 50 billion devices or whatever it is. Uh, this is not good. Um, we, we can't do things the way we've done things so far. So I say, you know what? We need to be 20% more efficient, 50% more energy efficient, uh, with a 25% lower cost to build, even though commodity prices are going up. Guys like me have to figure out how to do all that stuff. It still builds at 37,000 megawatt capacity, a new $305 billion market to stack on top of this 200 billion or whatever it is thus far. The growth has only begun. And again, wouldn't it be nice if this market is like flexible, scalable, modular, upgradable, reconfigurable to meet the needs of advancing technology would be kind of fun. Other thing of growth, this is a, a fun uh, diagram that I think TechCrunch guys did, the, the Internet of Things, which Cisco is talking about. Uh, 50 billion new devices. So we have 3 billion more new humans coming online. Uh, 50 billion new devices. From a data center guy, and, and I'm not ready to talk about it too much because I'm still thinking about it, but these 50 billion new devices, uh, you always have to bring people uh, onto the internet, and, and when you say bring people into the internet, you'll, you'll start to scare people because that starts to sound like Matrix-like. But, but uh, so I won't talk about that today, but these devices, they're devices. Um, do I need to bring these on the internet? Which then has me paint this data center picture of what this data center looks like to support these 50 billion new assets? Or do I start to combine all the challenges together in performance and latency and, and the fact that these devices have low cost commodity technology horsepower in them, what if I bring them in the network? What if they start to breed, become more the consolidated edge data centers? What if por portions of these 50 billion devices begin to store more of the personal data of users versus in these centralized data center facilities? And a lot of times people compare the data center infrastructure market to the energy infrastructure market. Um, a lot of people believe that energy generation is shifting to a distributed model. Um, in the US, there's a good part of my neighborhood that's all doing solar power, and I'm, I'm getting pretty close to myself. That mechanism is becoming distributed power generation is the future, particularly with all these uh, electric cars and so on and so forth. What if distributed data center becomes the future? And what if what we paint as edge data centers, which right now are, tend to be pop locations towards metropolitan cities, begin to shift closer to the users? And what if these 50 billion devices help enable that? That starts to shift the data center closer to the users and perhaps addresses some of those challenges with privacy and all kinds of fun things that we talk about. Who knows? Stuff I'm thinking about. <clears throat> China, um, I, I spent a lot of time in China. Uh, so by the way, China alone, particularly, because China has a lot of interest in, in upholding a lot of the data, in, in essence, uh, depending on how you could word it, protecting, controlling, whatever the, the national uh, security interests of their users and data. Um, so we're seeing a lot of growth there. Um, I, I believe there's a $100 billion emerging data center market in itself between now 2025, 2030. I believe there's more growth in China by 2025, 2030 than we've seen in the US. Um, largely driven by a massive, uh, massive population and emergence of internet. Um, and by the way, US is at 37 watts. I'm just assuming they go from three to 13 watts per citizen. Um, and again, going from you know, 600 to 1.1 billion users. Lots of fun growth in front of us. So wrapping up uh, predictions, uh, concluding my presentation. One, the vast majority of data center growth over the next 15 to 20 years is going to occur in emerging markets outside the US. Two, disruptive definition of how to accomplish Efficient emerging market growth is going to come not only to change the landscape of how data centers are developed, but just like what happened in modern manufacturing, is going to redefine the US market methodologies. I think 
the U.S. is going to can become behind because the growth isn't going to be occurring there. What's going to be occurring in the U.S. is the aging of our 15-year depreciable assets. Disaggregation between data center real estate construction and technology needs to occur, a new form of disaggregation. And then lastly, these new flexible data fa factories need to be ultimately flexible and reconfigurable, just like a server. If it financially and technologically makes sense, it must be upgradable. Um, and those are the areas that I think we need to focus on. Um, and that's kind of some of the stuff that I've been working on. So, thank you.